Uh, okay, so homework five was due this morning. So hopefully everyone got that uh, sent in just fine. Uh, if you recall, we've got all electronic submissions now. Seems to be the easiest way to grade them. Uh, homework six is already posted. I've got quiz two. I'll hand it back at the end of class. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll post a. I'll post the solutions to quiz two. Uh, I'll post the solutions to homework five. Uh, was that? And practice exam. Practice exam and practice exam solutions. So a whole slew of information is going on. Um, I would really highly recommend you take a look at homework six before Monday, so I can help answer any classes. I will be out on Tuesday, so I won't have office hours. Um, so that's why we really need to address any questions as soon as possible on Monday. So please take a look at that, at least have a, a concept of, of how we're going to do it. Uh, this one relies heavily on real data. So I posted two papers from the 1970s, which is like the heyday of fluid phase equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, so we're going to pull real data from a toluene heptane mixture and use that to tune activity coefficient models, uh, determine excess Gibbs free energy, and to do a flash calculation. And then you'll also use mixing information to do an energy balance on a flash separator. So for the exam, anything up until this point is basically fair game. We're going to emphasize fluid phase equilibrium. But if there's an energy balance, you know, don't, 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 don't blame me for not warning you that there may be an energy balance or an entropy balance on the project or the problem as well. Uh, okay, so no statmec. Yeah, yeah, we haven't had any substantial statmec homework problems, and so I, I tend to like to have exam questions be on similar themes as homework. So since there's been no homework on it, there's not going to be any exam stuff on statmec. So we've got plenty to talk about with phase equilibrium, regardless. Though. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about the ideal monatomic gas. So our goal is to derive using particle in a box with the internal energy and heat capacity of an ideal monatomic gas. Who remembers off the top of their heads what that it actually is? What are these values? What is the internal energy of an ideal monatomic gas? Or what is the heat capacity? We don't talk too much about U because we do reference states, but uh, what is the uh, heat capacity of an ideal monatomic gas? It's function of R, three, something. It's like 3R. 3R? Yeah. So, so close. close. 3 halves R. So that the internal energy is going to be 3 halves R D. So by the end of the day, we're going to start off with our crazy looking partition function, and hopefully by the end of the lecture, we'll get to this point here. So a quick recap. <clears throat> So epsilon is the energy of a single particle. Now, if this is a function of a particular series of parameters, uh, for example, we did particle in a box, like it was Lx, Ly, and Lz were these three quantum numbers, that would represent an energy state. But of course, we also have energy levels, where there's multiple energy states that can all have the same energy level. We talked about the probability of a system having a particular, so P of I is the probability of state I with energy E alpha. This was equal to a scaled form of the energy. This is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. We derived this based on assuming two, two bodies we're in thermal equilibrium, not necessarily with the same energy, but at the same thermal reservoir conditions. And then you normalize it by all of the possible configurations of the system, because the probability has to add up to one. So this here is all the possible configurations. You're going to be at one of the possible energy states, for example. And what we did is we defined the denominator as the partition function specifically the canonical partition function. And 
V beta. Constant number of particles, constant volume, constant temperature. Beta. We didn't talk about this yet, but eventually we'll derive how we can draw a connection between beta and kVt, specifically today, how we're going to get to these values here. And Q is equal to the canonical partition function. Now, there are different types of partition functions. The canonical is nVt or nV beta, right? Holding constant n, v, and t. Now, uh, uh, macroscopically, which function shares the same, same constants? Or, no, rather, sorry. Which, which macroscopic thermodynamic function is the most convenient to evaluate when you have constant n, v, and t? Uh, 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 function. Helmholtz, Gibbs, enthalpy, entropy, which one's native variables are NVT? Internal energy. Helmholtz energy. Right, Gibbs is a PT, A is VT, U is VS, and H is PS. What's that word for the partition function? This is canonical. C A N canon ickle. <laughs> <laughs> so each of these sort of macroscopic functions are going to have a similar partition function where it's like most native to calculate it. So truth be told, it's easiest to go from the canonical partition function to the Helmholtz energy, but truth be told, it's not the most intuitive function to think about thermodynamically. So that's why we, we focus on the internal energy, which is a little bit more of an intuitive value to calculate. But every single one of these thermodynamic variables is going to have a corresponding partition function, which is relatively easy to draw the connections to. Um, okay. Uh, da -da -da. <clears throat> what we also showed... So this is Q, this is the canonical partition function. This is for many particles. We're going to talk about today little q. We're going to be introducing this term here. Little q is going to be the partition function for just one particle. Same way how we used uh, omega. It's very sloppy omega. This is the degeneracy for one particle. And similarly, we used omega for the degeneracy of many. Degeneracy for many particles. I'll call it n particles. Just a quick definition recap. And what we found was that, this is where we ended on Wednesday, U is the average energy of the system. So if we sum up over all of the states, we times the probability of being in that state by the energy of that state. <coughs> Excuse me. And we found that this is directly related to the partition function. Through that relationship. So our objective today is going to be derive the partition function for a single monatomic gas particle. We're then going to combine many single ideal monatomic gases to a collection of particles, derive the partition function for that, apply this relationship here, and we should spit out the internal energy of an ideal monatomic gas. So hopefully getting us a little bit out of the weeds of some of these seemingly arbitrarily defined functions. So, an ideal monatomic gas. Give me an example of an ideal monatomic gas. Argon. Bingo. Helium. Helium. All of these ones. So what's, so what's special? Helium, argon, da, 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 versus, let's say, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on and so forth. 
What's special about helium argon that they is different? Zero balance. Was that? They have no, they have zero balance, balance here. Zero balance. I'm not quite sure. Uh, they have they have balance. Balance. Oh, balance. oh no, no, no. Uh, in terms of, in terms of, let's say, so here's an ideal monatomic. Here's let's say a diatomic. Yeah. So what's 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 different about? There's no chemical bonds. There's no chemical bonds. This one's symmetric, this one's asymmetric. If I rotate this one, does it do anything? No. If I rotate this one, does it do something? Mm -hmm. Right? So this one has additional degrees of freedom. This one has an additional rotational degree of freedom. This one has no rotational degrees of freedom. So this one only has three degrees of freedom. Basically, x, y, and z velocities. The diatomic gas has additional degrees of freedom, and we'll tackle those in a little bit. So, so if we're dealing with a, a system here, let's say we have a particle with uh, three uh, energy states. Okay, so let's say, for example, we have a particle. We'll simplify this down in a bit, but we have three translational energy states. Now, in the case of a real particle, there's effectively an infinite number of energy states, but the problem is you're scaling it. So the higher the energy you get, the lower the probability, and it ends up just working out fine. But let's say we have a simple system where we have three translational energy states. Let's say it can have a velocity of one, one, and one in the three different dimensions, or three rotational states, you know, maybe spinning at different speeds, for example. So if we were to write out all of the possible energy states, we could write that we have the energy translation one, energy rotation one, we have energy translation two, energy rotation two, energy translation three, energy rotation three, you get the pattern so far, da -da 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 -da. do the same thing again, and then down here at the bottom we would have energy translation three, energy rotation three. So this is the case, there would be nine energy states total. Everyone follow along? Our objective right now, of course, everything we're doing in StatMech, our objective is to get to the partition function. The partition function here is the summation of all of the different energy states scaled by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So the first step is to tabulate all the possible energy states, calculate all their energies, add them all up, and then play around with the mathematics a little bit. So then, from this approach right here, we can write the single particle partition function, Q, as the summation, the scale summation of all of the different energy states. So this would be E to the minus beta times the translation one plus energy rotation one. <coughs> right, so the energy of this state is just the energy of the translational mode plus the energy of the rotational mode, and that's how much energy the particle has. Plus, again, it's going to be exactly the same pattern, translational two, no, no. Oh, wait, hold on. I, I, yeah. And this would have to be one, one there. Sorry. There'd be rotations this way, translations this way. So this would be translation one plus energy rotation two, and so on and so forth. And again, we have a total of nine different terms. Last one down at the bottom would be minus beta energy translation three plus energy rotation three.
So due to the properties of exponents, if I add two numbers together inside of an exponent, that's exactly equivalent of multiplying the two exponents together. So we can actually rewrite this like so. So if I were to like, you know, mul cross multiply all these together, I would get nine terms, right? This times by this, times by this, times by this. That's the first row. Translation two times rotation one times rotation two times rotation three. That's the second row. And then this one would be the third row. So I can write that down individually. So ultimately, I can simplify my single particle partition function to a partition function associated with the translational partition function and another one associated with the rotational partition function. And this is going to be valid for any situation where the energy of the rotation is independent from the energy of the translation. And that's going to be a relatively good approximation for something like this, unless we're dealing with, I guess, something weird and extreme. But in general, for simplification, this is the approach we're going to assume for the most part, that the different energy modes are going to be independent from one another. So effectively, what we're saying is that we're going to take all the different ways that we can have the system store energy in one particular way, times that by all the different ways it can store the energy in another particular way, and so on and so forth. This is going to be for independent energy modes. build up a little bit more complexity. So if we go back here, we have a single particle partition function. For an ideal monatomic gas, we're only going to have translational energy modes. But we have three different translational energy modes, x, y, and z. So we're going to be able to break those down into three individual steps. But then we still need to scale it up to a collection of particles. So the overall partition function for a collection of indistinguishable particles is going to be given by this expression here. This is for indistinguishable particles. Such a long word. For distinguishable particles, it's going to be talk about these in just a sec. We also, these all assume sort of general combinatorials. So let's say, for example, I have 
three bins, bin one, bin two, bin three, one, two, three, and I have three balls, one, two, three. If these particles are distinguishable, how many different ways do I have to put each one of these three balls into these three bins? If they're indistinguishable? If they're distinguishable. So if I have a label for these are different colors, this is red, blue, and green, for example. So how many ways can I put one of the balls into bin one? Three different ways. How many, so if I put one of the balls into here, how many are left? Two. two. So I have two choices. And then I have one final choice. Right, I would have six different ways to organize these individuals. Consequently, if they are indistinguishable, right, as I'm working out my math, I'm going to call particle one, particle one, particle two, particle two, and so on and so forth. So then this 3 factorial for n equals 3 needs to be accounted for when the particles are indistinguishable. Now, if this were the case, I had one particle. If I had three different atom types in a box, let's say helium, argon, and neon, for example. One factorial would be 1, so then my partition function would be helium partition function times by argon partition function times by neon partition function, right? But instead, if they are three unique, sorry, three indistinguishable particles, then I have to factor this by an indistinguishability factor, because there's fewer different ways that the system can organize. Are we okay? Can you show us what the number of ways would be if they're in, uh, indistinguishable? So if they're indistinguishable, there's only one way. Okay. Because that would be one particle in any box. And if I swap two particles or swap the boxes, it wouldn't make a difference. So if they're indistinguishable, then there's no, there's only one way to put them in there. One particle in each box. Because I wouldn't be able to tell which particle was in, what, what, within each bin. So a lot of StatMet classes will start with really onerous uh, combinatorial statistics. I tend to like to avoid that and just focus on simplified systems that uh, we don't have to worry too much about those. But that's the general approach of a lot of StatMet classes. And I don't think it's particularly useful for chemical engineers. Okay, so now I think we've established all of the general rules. Over here, we have independent energy modes all multiplied together to give us the single particle partition function. Now we know how to combine single particle partition functions for a collection of n number of particles. So the objective is we need to calculate the single particle partition function for an ideal monatomic gas, which only has translational energy modes. That is our objective. So what we're going to start off with uh, <clears throat> is we're going to do particle in a box. This is going to be our model for an ideal monatomic gas. <coughs> So we're going to assume no interactions. What this basically means is that the, the energy state of I of particle I doesn't affect the energy state of particle J. That every single particle is 100% independent. And particle 1 doesn't care if it has a velocity of 7, and particle 2 a velocity of a million, it doesn't matter. They're all going to have completely independent 
behavior interactions. There's going to be no structural correlation. There's going to be no interactions. So the energy is only going to be that. Next, we're going to assume Uh, let's put it this way. Um, we're going to assume only translational energy for the system. Now, when we start talking about interacting particles and then rederiving the virial equation of state, that's where we're going to start to consider something called configurational energy which depends on the positions of particles. But for the, and now, the only energy we're going to consider is translational energy, meaning that the energy of the system is going to be the summation of all of the individual energies added together. When we deal with interacting particles, then it gets a lot more complicated. So for particle in a box, the energy is a function of three parameters. These are quantum numbers for x, y, and z translational dimensions in three-dimensional space. Now we could, of course, do this in 2D space if we wanted to. Uh, I'm actually just going to call this a times lx squared plus ly squared plus lz squared, where a is some prefactor h squared over times the mass times the volume to the two-thirds. <coughs> so this is all the information we need to know to write the single particle partition function. What we have here is an expression for the energy of a single particle. So all we need to do is add up all the possible <coughs> configurations. So in that case, the single particle partition function is we have to add up all of the possible configurations of, this, of these parameters, Lx, Ly, and Lz, which are going to be integers. But we can break this into individual steps. write it as independent energy modes. So effectively, right, as a reminder, our goal is to get to the internal energy of the system. Right, this is our objective, effectively. We're trying to get to the internal energy, which is the negative partial derivative of the natural log of the partition function with respect to beta, or temperature. You can think of it like that as well. The partition function for a collection of particles is just the, uh, all the different energy states of all the individual particles times together. So that's going to be the partition function raised to the power of the number of particles. It's going to be Q1 times Q2 times Q3 times Q4 and so on and so forth, but we have an indistinguishability factor 
because I can't tell the difference between one, two, three, four, and five apart. So that reduces the number of possible states in the system. And then again here we have the partition function for a single particle is going to be the partition function for the translation in x direction times the translation in y direction times the translation in z direction. So then I can rewrite that as the partition function in the x raised to the third power raised to the n power. So as, a, as a recap of where we're going with this. So what we need to do then is just evaluate this integral, rather this summation, which is, you know, well, truth be told, we could somehow just work our way through it. Uh, but we can make it a little bit easier. I personally don't enjoy working with infinite summations. I would much rather deal with continuous functions. So the question is, can we replace the summation with an integral? So we're going to do a little bit of approximating to see, is it really important that these energy levels are so far apart <coughs> that I have to keep track of energy level 1 plus energy level 2 plus energy level 3 plus energy level 4? Or are they really, really close together so I can just approximate it as a continuous function? Right? So when it comes to num uh, uh, numerical integration or quadrature, right? Basically, as you get your step size smaller and smaller and smaller, you get more and more accurate. So for some energy levels and energy states, we can't approximate the summation with an integral. Now, this would be the case for uh, vibrational energy modes or electronic energy modes. Those are actually really, really far apart. Rotational modes, uh, spinning molecules, that's really easy to do. Vibrating molecules is actually relatively difficult. Exciting electronic energy states is even more difficult. Right? The energy that it takes to actually do, in, induce one of these vibrations is relatively difficult. Um, here's, here's another way I like to sort of uh, uh, relate things. So basically we've got translation, we have vibration, oh, sorry, no, 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 no. we have rotation, we have vibration, and we have, I don't know, this is a funny one here, we can have electronic energy states being excited. Okay, so which of these processes, trying to guess now, give us more physical intuition of what we're talking about here, which of these processes has the most energy? The exciting in the energy state. Well, or the electron, electron the right. Electron, yeah. uh, which has the least amount of energy required? Translation. Translation is very, very low. So if you are in the lab and your advisor asks you to investigate electronic changes in your molecule of interest, how do you do that? Spectroscopically. What wavelength of light? UV. UV, right? What wavelength of light is associated with vibrational modes? IR. Which is higher energy? UV. UV, so in this case, this is going to be UV. This is going to be infrared. So actually, for rotations, I believe it's microwave. And you've got to go really low temperatures to do microwave spectroscopy. But you can actually look at rotations of molecules. And then for translation, I think it's extremely low. I'm not sure if there's a good spectroscopic technique to look at this one. But you have to go to very low temperatures. But as an idea, right, so then every single one of these energy modes is going to be a little bit more. So rotations, this is going to be something where we can replace all the different energy levels with an integration with an integral. But for uh, vibrations and electronic states, those energy levels are actually going to be relatively far apart. So it's actually harder to activate those different energy modes. Okay, so, but let's get back to what we're talking about here. For translation, can we replace this summation with an integral? So what we're going to look at is that this prefactor A, if I plug in some reasonable numbers here, so if you have one particle, the mass uh, oh geez, my nose. Uh, is about 10 to the minus 22 grams. And if you have a volume of approximately 1 liter, A, as it turns out, is approximately 10 to the minus 40 joules. Very, very small number. Beta which is equal to 1 over k 
ABT. is approximately 1 over 10 to the minus 23, or 10 to the 23. So that means the product here of A times beta, which is the factor that we care about right here, right, which is the difference between the step sizes, right, because this is from quantum mechanics, LX is going to be 1, it's going to be 2, it's going to be 3, it's going to be an integer. So the product of these two is going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 17. So if my steps and in, in energy states are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that means every step of 1 only moves my function by about 10 to the minus 17. So in this case, it is OK to integrate instead of using discrete levels. Because the different energy levels associated with slight changes in the quantum number is very, very small. <coughs> so, we're going to rewrite the partition function for the x translation. Right now it's e to the minus beta a x squared. We're going to rewrite this as an integral going from 0 to infinity. Now you could do 1 from infinity, but it's not going to make much of a difference. <coughs> e to And then I'll rewrite this one more time, just to make the math a little bit simpler. So this function here has a, has a defined integral. So this, this one here? Yeah. Yeah, it should be here. E to the minus A prime L X squared. And still DLX. Oh, yes. DLX, sorry. Thank you. So we're just replacing that infinite summation with an integral. Yeah. This integral has this form. This is the error function. So if we evaluate 
our single particle partition function for the translation and the x-direction. Got a definite integral, so we just do the bounds. At infinity, the error function is equal to 1. At 0, the error function is equal to 0. So if we do all the substitutions here, we get that the single particle partition function for the x translation. big chunky mess. We repeat this process for x, y, and z. It's exactly the same. Just substitute it in different subscripts. So this is effectively equal to q x cubed. <coughs> and the single particle partition function that we derive this is for an ideal monatomic gas with only translational energy modes. So we're almost there. We're very, very close. So then we take our single particle partition function, we scale it up for an arbitrary number of particles. So our collection of particles partition function Next step, we take our goal right here, of course, is to calculate the internal energy. So we need to evaluate the natural log of the partition function. So we do that next step there. We just need to evaluate the internal energy. So I'm going to simplify this a little bit. The natural log of n factorial, the number of particles factorial, that has no beta dependence. That's going to go away. This one has no beta dependence. That's going to go away. So the only thing that state that remains in this process is
So just evaluating the, uh, the partial derivative. And why does this go to zero? Because uh, there's no dependence at all on beta in those terms. So using log properties, we can sort of separate all of those individual terms. Oh. So we pull the negatives out. This gives us 3 halves n over beta, which is equal to 3 halves n kb t. So if we scale this up for a mole's worth of particles, where Avogadro's number is the number of particles in our system, that means the number of particles times by the Boltzmann constant is simply equal to the ideal gas constant. In that case, the internal energy is 3 halves n r, oh, so 3 halves rt. And we have, we can do it here for per molecule, or we can do it per mole. Now, the last step is that the heat capacity is defined as how the internal energy changes with respect to temperature. So if we take the derivative of this function here with respect to temperature, it's just simply 3 halves R. Now, this is just the internal energy. So we threw away a lot of these terms here. For other thermodynamic functions, we're going to be taking other partial derivatives of the partition function. So for, uh, for the pressure, it's going to be a function of the volume. Now if I take, if I play around with the math a little bit, which thermodynamic function, or which, so we could, not know that, silly question, but basically if we take the partial derivative with respect to pressure with some other manipulations, we're going to spit out the ideal gas law actually. But right now, we need to connect, basically, the microscopic world to the macroscopic world. So far, we've done it for internal energy. So now we need to manipulate it a little bit to come up with other individual functions. How can we take the partition of function to get entropy, to get enthalpy, to get Helmholtz energy, to get pressure? And so what we're going to be doing next is we're going to be taking these comparisons here between the partition function and the energy, and then relying a little bit on classical thermodynamics to come up with other relationships in the same way that we manipulated other classical thermodynamic functions. So I think it's kind of neat that we go all the way from a quantum mechanical description of, uh, let's see if I erased it all, we go all the way from a quantum mechanical description of a particle in a box, we take a ton of non-interacting particles in a box, and it just so happens to spit out exactly what we see for classical thermodynamics for the heat capacity and internal energy of a monatomic gas. But we're also going to be looking at what's the entropy, what's the Helmholtz, and all that different uh, types of information. Uh, any questions on this content here? I think it's pretty neat. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, we, we have no proving yet that KB, that beta is one over KB. No, the, the relationship right here, you know, and the Sandler book takes this approach where it relies very heavily. It doesn't do sort of really theoretical or fundamental derivations. What it basically does is says, you know, oh, okay, this is what we know from classical thermodynamics. This is what we know from statistical mechanics. So the only way that these two can be married together is if beta is equal to the reciprocal of Boltzmann constant over temperature. So that's kind of the hand wavy approximation that the Sandler book takes on this matter here. So it's not a very rigorous thermodynamic definition or something like that. But that's kind of the approach it takes where it says, in order to marry these two, if we just say that beta is equal to 1 over kBT, it all seems to work out. Don't ask too many questions. That's, that's basically the, the approach that it takes there. Cool. Well, I've got the quizzes, so don't run out too quickly. Um, and I'll uh, we'll see you on. Uh, also, I'll post a ton of stuff this afternoon. I'm not going to send you an email. Uh, and I'll try and get the, uh, the project posted over the weekend as well. 
so you'll have a mountain of information to, uh, to look at in preparation for the exam. Okay, thanks.